This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Our framework of the information we have 
and there is our sense of recollecting and experiencing things. And those two things fit together, and we, we often use, as a really relating to what we've just heard, we often use that framework of knowledge in, uh, and fit our recollective experience into it. So if I try and imagine a specific thing that happened to me maybe five years ago, I would think about where I was living then, how old my children were, what kind of um, job I was doing at that time, what office I was working in, and all of that information that I have, that knowledge that I have, very generic knowledge, will give me a frame for me to fit in those recollective details and to reconstruct or to construct um, a recollective experience, an episodic memory of what, what happened at that time. Um, and those two things um, fit together to give us these kind of recollective experiences. Um, and I, one thing that I have learned, and I, I guess it kind of sounds obvious, but it's only when you work with people who have disruption to memory that you realise how powerful it is, is that this, this type of autobiographical memory, this ability to, to kind of live um, in the past and, and recollect the past, has really, really important functions for us. So I'm going to spend a bit more time talking about this, but I, I think it's, it does play an absolutely vital role in our sense of who we are, our sense of identity. Um, and one of the things that, that we do is that we ask people to complete the following sentence. I am a... So in your mind, if you complete that sentence for me, I am a... Okay, so I might say I am a mother, I am a memory researcher. Now do one other thing for me. When, I, when you say I am a something, just cast your mind back and just come up with maybe a couple of specific memories that come to mind when you say that. It can be anything at all, but specific memories for everything. Okay, now I don't know if anyone feels like they would like to share anything of what they've said. Is there anyone who's willing to to kind of share what they've said. Yeah, go on then. So what was your I am first of all? I'm a father. I'm a father. And I thought at the moment with my children, well, my second child being born, and my oldest son in the school for the first time. Okay. So what... Very <laughs> cliche. No, no, that's fantastic. Fantastically illustrated. So I don't know how this fits in with what everybody else does. But, but what we find is if we ask people to say I am, and we do this with maybe up to 10 statements, and then ask them to generate three memories for each one, those memories will tend to be very defining memories. They're not, they don't tend to be random, oh, I went for a bike ride with him yesterday. They tend to be a birth, if you're talking about a father. First day at school is very much a defining moment of being a father. And uh, I did this, now I'm going to forget this guy's name because my own memory is terrible. Famous Shakespearean actor, Simon Double Bell. No, Russell Beale. That's the one. I did this with him once. Um, I somehow ended up on a stage talking to Simon Russell Beard about his memory. So I did this with him and he said, I am an actor, which was a good start. Um, and his first memory he came up with, the earliest, because what's really interesting is if you track back and usually take the earliest of the memories, they will tend to be a moment at which you could argue you became that thing. So if I say I am a memory researcher, which was the thing I did when I had this done on me, the first, the earliest memory, not necessarily the first, but the earliest memory I came up with was actually going for my PhD interview. So that's an example of that being the moment at which I would argue I became a memory researcher. Uh, so Simon Russell Beale said, well, my, my earliest of the memories I'm going to give you is um, going on stage as Hamlet. And I said, oh, you know, when, at what point was that in your career? And he said, he said, oh, you know, it was a little way in. And I said, oh, that's interesting because normally that the earliest memory is the point at which somebody becomes that thing. And he, he said, uh, no, that was the moment at which I became an actor. I always said to myself, once I played Hamlet, I was an actor. So it worked with him as well. So it's very much this concept of becoming something at that time. Um, and so I'm going to come back to this picture in a minute, but here's a few kind of moments from my life. Um, that are things that I think that these are moments that, that enable me to have a sense of who I am. So I am a runner, sort of, of kind, maybe a jogger. Um, I am an academic, I am a parent, I am a musician, I am a friend, I am a walker. So these are all memories that I have that relate to who I am. 
Um, a couple of other things which, again, I think we, we've sort of talked about a bit already. The autobiographical memory um, provides us with a narrative. Um, it, it's, it's kind of, for, for people who have disruption to their memory, it's almost like walking into a film halfway through with no idea what's already happened and not kind of remembering it as it unfolds. Um, and, and we've already talked about why it's very important in terms of setting goals. Um, and I'm going to come back to this when I look at memory impairments again, but it's a hugely important part of us having a shared social world and the way that we communicate and interact with people. We've talked a bit about the remembering imagining system, um, and, and I will come back to that as well. But what I want to focus on right now is the fact that memories, our autobiographical memories, tend to be unevenly distributed over the lifespan. So if I ask you to think of your favourite favourite film, your favourite book, your favourite uh, piece of music, or in fact if I just give you a word and say come up with the first memory that comes to mind, if I do that enough times with say 10 favourite books or give you 10 words, what we find is that there is a tendency for people to choose things and remember things and generate or produce memories that come from adolescence, come from the period of time between sort of the age of 10 and 30. There's a real dearth of memory, memories um, pre, uh, sort of about the age of 4 or 5, um, and then there's a big sort of gap in the middle. So, so we have this, I, I won't go through this because I've just basically said it, but this, this thing is called a reminiscence bump, um, and it's something that really, really fascinates me. Um, and it's interesting actually that the case you talk about is somebody who ends up going back to his teenage years because those teenage years, as it turns out, are probably the most important bits that he could go back to. And it's incredibly robust. It doesn't matter how you do it. In fact, the, my favourite one was um, that you could give somebody a, the name Richard and ask them to come up with any Richard they like and they will still come up with a Richard from their reminiscence bump. That's my favourite version of that study. Um, and it's really helpful because it helps us to think about how memories are organised, how resilient they are, why is it that, that we can remember something from our teenage years maybe clearer and better than we can remember something that happened say five years ago. And for me, because I'm really interested in trying to help and support people that have memory difficulties, it's very important to understand that reminiscence bump and what's going on. Um, but, from the point of view of what we're talking about today, I think it's very, very important in terms of understanding um, the role that memory plays in, in our identity. So I'm a big fan of case studies. It's not something that scientists always love, but I really like case studies. I've learned a huge amount from, from doing case studies. I do obviously do group studies as well. But this guy was a 96-year-old guy. He spoke four different languages. He lived a very rich life. We tested his memory clinically, and he had a very, very good memory. And then we did that study. We gave him um, <coughs> A list of words and we just said when we give you a word just come up with the first memory that comes to mind and then we aged that memory and we plotted them and what you can see there is despite the fact that he's 96 the number of memories he has at 21 to 30 is much much higher and that's to me really fascinating that you can speak to someone who's 96 and they've still got that reminiscence bump in fact the older people are the more robust that finding it seems to be um, and what I did, didn't tell you about this guy, I told you he spoke four languages, but we actually tried prompting him in those four different languages. So they were English, Spanish, Italian, and French. And he'd learned them at different points in his life. And then we plotted those. And this is, I don't know how interesting this is to you, but I find it really fascinating and it does fit with some of the other literature. The first language he learned was French. This is the purple line. The second language he learned Spanish, followed shortly by Italian, so that's the red line and the green line. And the last language he learned was English, which is here. So when you actually look at the breakup of those memories, that overall reminiscence bump, it is dependent on language and when he learned the language. So it's almost like the reminiscence bump shifts depending on what language he was um, speaking. And I, I just I haven't gone too far down that road because it's another one that could entice me off into another world. But, but 
the, the role that language plays in memory is not something to be underestimated, and I think it's something that's very relevant when we look at um, people who have language difficulties or um, where there is no language. I do think language is an important part of that. So I just want to um, uh, just take a slight diversion and talk about the, the research that I've done looking at memory and identity using music as a tool. Please, Collins at the back there, because I listened to his Desert Island disc quite recently, actually, only about two weeks ago. I'm obsessed by Desert Island discs. For those of you that don't know, people have to um, choose eight songs and they can take them if they were locked away on a desert island. This is my dream. I'm fascinated by music, and actually, it's just the most amazing um, uh, source of data. <laughs> Because you ask people what music they choose, they're asked to explain why they've chosen that music, um, and essentially what you get is autobiographical memories. So I'm going to come back to that, but that inspired this, um, this piece of research that I did. Um, so we wanted to look at the reminiscence bump in relation to music. I am very, very interested in the power that music has and um, to, to kind of give you a sense of comfort, identity, foundation, it's a social, it, it really, it, I think its power is to some extent wrapped up in its ability to help us remember. And there's a few interesting studies that have looked at musical reminiscence bumps and what they've done is they've asked people to just choose um, music that, no, not choose, to, to recognise music or they've given them pieces of music and asked them to um, talk about what it reminds them of. And these first kind of studies have shown fairly robustly we have a preference and better recognition for music in our adolescent years and during that whole period from uh, 10 to 30. My favourite reminiscence bump uh, study is the cascading reminiscence bump finding, which is that 20 year olds have a, their, show a preference for their parents' reminiscence bump, music from their parents' reminiscence time, and their grandparents. So, if you think about it, when you're in your reminiscence time, if you're when you're a kind of teenager, your parents are playing their music, but also they to some extent be playing the music that their parents play because that's in their reminiscence bump. And it's just this brilliant finding that the reminiscence bump is so robust that you can actually track it back across gen uh, generations. So I'm just going to briefly tell you about the study we did. Um, I've actually sort of slightly expanded this data set now, but we looked at musicians versus non-musicians, and we just asked them to name 10 tracks. I essentially did a Desert Island disc song. Name 10 tracks, tell me what you chose for them, uh, and what age were they. And I just want to give you some examples of the reasons that they gave, because I think this starts to give you some qualitative feel for how memory and identity is tied up. So here, it reminds me of the first time I went to visit my sister in the States. She took us to an area where teenagers met when I was a kid I really liked. I kept asking my sister if we could go again to this place, and now, every time I listen to it, it reminds me of that experience. Um, Self-defining, this is an example of self-defining memory, which is something I've particularly been looking out for um, in this data set. The Grey Sand album was the soundtrack to my late teens, early twenties. This track appealed to me because I was interested in Africa. It led me to listen to a great variety of world music. My latest went to Africa to work and change the direction of my life. So they've chosen a piece of music that changed the direction of their life. In other words, it was a self-defining moment. This, this music, they linked to this whole life decision that they made. So by listening to that piece of music again, they are returning to that memory that reinforces their sense of this is who I am, this is what I do, this is part of my identity. So a lot of going back to these pieces of music is about reinforcing that time. And interestingly, a huge number of people you, uh, give the piece of music that they listen to when their child was first born. It's a really, really common response. This was the music that was playing when my child was first born or when I first got back with my new child. So that's, that's a really common one. And sometimes they're a bit more generic. So I played this a lot in the two and a half years I spent with my husband and two small children in the Middle East of the country. It brings back the bright, light, and dusty atmosphere of the place and the simplicity of the house we lived in. So I guess why I, what I love about music is that it's very good for getting people to tell these stories. I could sort of ask you to tell me stories or I could try prompting them, but music seems to prompt them really, really easily. And what I get is this lovely, rich, qualitative data which tells me 
what memories are important to people and what role and function that plays in giving people a, a sort of sense of identity and a sense of who they are. Um, so I'll just quickly run through some of the data. This is um, the reminiscence bump we've got. So when we've actually plotted the ages of the music that people give, um, we've got a reminiscence bump, although it's earlier than it is for other things, which is interesting in its own right, around 15 to 19 there. Interestingly, when you compare musicians and non-musicians, the musicians have a bigger reminiscence bump, which to me is at least some evidence that it is kind of supporting um, that formation of identity as someone as a musician, so their self-defining moments of their reminiscence bump is bigger. And also when you look at musicians versus non-musicians, so if you look at the non-musicians first of all, then this is now literally just the number of self-defining memories that they've produced. So if they've said, I've chosen this music because it was the number one record when my daughter was born, or because this is the sole reason I'm a sound engineer now, these are self-defining, they've chosen it for what we call a self-defining memory. That music helps to reinforce the sense of what they've become. Uh, so the, there is a bigger percentage of self-defining memories in this reminiscence period, but actually what's interesting is that the musicians have they, they have earlier self-defining memories, so they they are going back earlier in their life to self-defining moments that, they, that that music reminds them of. Uh, just briefly to talk about Desert Island Disc, if you haven't listened to it, do. If you've listened to it, carry on listening to it because it does just, it's all there, it's all in the archive and it's just fantastic to go back to. But throughout these, uh, as I say, I'm listening to them obsessively now and doing lots of coding. Um, but um, these are the kind of things you get, um, and this is just a quote from Ed Miliband, um, but you can see anybody having that experience as a child that runs a marvel policy so I think gosh this really matters. So this again he's chosen a song that he links with a moment at which he decided to become a politician. Um, and just to give you some preliminary results of, of some of the analysis actually we've just finished another load more. But when we look at Desert Island Disc, despite it being an entertainment program, there is still um, a, quite a significant reminiscence bump in the songs that people choose and the reasons that they give for them. So, before I move on to the, the sort of final bit, just to say, um, the conclusions that I have from this is that the influence that music has on us is really tied up in its ability to help us reminisce. And I think that's music people do link with their identity and I think it is because it helps people to reminisce and to go back to those self-defining memories. Um, and we get a reminiscence bump, it's earlier than it is for other stimuli, um, and also it's bigger in musicians and, and there are earlier self-defining memories. So to me this is all kind of adding up to this um, support for the hypothesis that the reminiscence bump and the reason we have more memories from that period of time is that they're memories that we go back to time and time and time again because they reinforce our sense of who we are. So the theory is that during that time is when we are, are our self and our identity is at its most, um, or where, where it's most formed, I guess, and so we go back to those lots of times. And it's not that there aren't other things in our life that are important, but that just seems to be a very important time for it. Um, obviously, neurobiologically, there are other, there's support for us um, having more memories from that time because neurobiologically we are at our prime for remembering during that time as well. But I don't think those things are mutually exclusive. So I want to go on to just talk about what happens when autobiographical memory is disrupted. So I'm going to go back to this picture and I, I shamelessly have stolen this idea from a student, but I think it um, demonstrates really, really clear, clearly what you can think of happens when people start to lose these memories. So if you imagine that I've, I've got all of those memories and suddenly, maybe through a process of progressive memory loss, or maybe not so suddenly if it happens overnight, these moments disappear from my life. And I am left with what is actually a relatively empty canvas. Um, and when I saw what a student used this to do a presentation, and I thought it is so clearly to demonstrate what I kind of see happening. Suddenly, all of those things that make me who I am have gone. I can't go back to them. I can't revisit them. I can't go back to those times that make me feel like I am me. 
And I just want to briefly mention Clive Rowan. I'm sure most of you have come across this guy, but I had the great pleasure to meet him. And he's an extraordinary man. He um, was very highly educated. He was a musical scholar. And he is probably the most pro profound of music that, that we know of and that we that has kind of managed to survive brain damage and still be kind of alive. And he literally has a conscious memory, a sort of recollective experience of about 15 to 20 seconds. So you can sit and talk to him. He will turn around and maybe walk over to the piano and look back and say, what are you doing here? Do you? How have you got in here? And then he'll kind of laugh it off because somewhere inside he kind of knows implicitly you know, he's learned over the years not to get angry about that. And for those of you that haven't seen his diary writing, when he writes, I am awake for the first time, this is the very first time I've woken up, and then crosses it out over and over and over again, you must find it on YouTube and watch it, because it's, it is, it's um, just the most, I think, dramatic illustration of what it is like to not have a past of any kind. And What's interesting is that he does have knowledge about himself. He knows who he is. He can tell you stuff about himself. He knows he's a music scholar. And I kind of liken this to maybe the first two years of your life. You will not have, oh, it's highly unlikely, you'll have any recollective experience at that time. Certainly not the first year of your life. Maybe not even the first three or four years of your life. But you know stuff about it, right? You know where you were living. I know that I was taken on a holiday to Switzerland when I was six months old because I've seen the pictures, but I have no idea of what that felt like. So for him, and I think this is a really important distinction to understand when we talk about autobiographical memory, there is knowledge, there are facts, there's information, and there is the sense, that emotional connection, the recollective experience of actually being able to be back in that moment. And that's what Clive has absolutely nothing of. And so for him, he's constantly in this moment of having just woken up. Because for him, all of that other stuff can never ever happen. Nothing has ever happened to him before. Um, and one of the things he does, I'm going to come back to this in a second, is that he plays patience. He spends an awful lot of time playing patience. Um, and I will come back to that in just a second. So finally, I just want to talk about the uh, collaborative work I've been doing with Martin Conway and Shona Illingworth and Claire. So Claire is a, a lady with amnesia. She is very much part of our team. She is, without any shadow of a doubt, the biggest expert on our team because she knows what it's like to have amnesia. Um, and uh, some of our work is currently in the Welcome Exhibition States of Mind and there's a, another one going in, I think, in the middle room in about um, 10 days' time, and I would really recommend, I've seen what Shona's done with it so far, and it's a very, very powerful experience. She, what she's managed to do is really capture that experience of being um, amnesic and put it into an exhibition. So Claire had amnesia because of viral encephalitis, like Clive did. Um, you can see she's got um, quite a big lesion in her brain. And she has very little recollective experience. So she, she does have quite a lot of knowledge. She's able to acquire that knowledge over time. But if you ask her to recall something from a few days ago, there's pretty much nothing, nothing there. She will learn stuff. She will learn stuff like we might learn a maths equation. So she will learn stuff about her life, and she will be able to tell you that stuff about her life but she does have very little recollective experience. I think one of the things, though, to get across is that it's not black and white, and this is one of the things I've really learned from working with Claire, is that it's not, it's not simply there's nothing or there's everything. She, she has, I, the easiest way that I can describe it is that it's almost like you trying to remember something that happened to you when you were five. So her remembering yesterday is more like you trying to remember something that happened when you were five. It's not like there's nothing there. But it's, there's very little there, it's very grainy, and you're relying very heavily on, on kind of knowledge in order to try and um, put that together. And when you ask her to talk about the past or the future, and this is where this kind of remembering imagining um, system comes in, this, con this fact that they're both built from the same system, she says, the past is a place I can't enter or feel, and the future is just frightening. I can't imagine, I can't see myself. She finds it almost impossible to imagine herself in a future situation. And so we've talked about time travel, a 
and daydreaming. And I would guarantee that however amazing I might have been, I'm sorry, no tangos, no magic tricks, none of that stuff, but however hard I might try to engage you, you most of you at some point have gone off into a, what am I going to eat tonight? Or what did I do yesterday? Or I've said something that's cued a memory for you and you've gone off on a little trip and hopefully at some point come back again. Um, but that, that sort of mind wandering, that daydreaming, that time travel, Claire can't do that. So when she's sitting on her own, say for example on a tube, if, she, if she's not talking to you, she gets lists out. She gets her lists out. She gets, she's got with her all the time sort of information. What is, what is she, where is she going to go? What is she going to think about next? Um, and this is what her life is like. She doesn't have that capacity to explore it, to think back over it. She's not like the, uh, um, the character in um, of the sex book because she does know who she is. Interestingly, she also has prosopagnosia, which means she has um, no face recognition. So when she looks in the mirror, she doesn't. She'll know it's her if she's standing in front of it, but there have been a couple of occasions where she's caught her reflection and thought, who's that? And not know that it's her. Um, so what I, I've learned from Claire, and I think this is one of the fantastic things about this Welcome Trust project, is firstly that working with an artist has made me ask questions I would never have asked. She's asked questions I would never have asked. And I've also spent a huge amount of time with Claire, masses of time. We went away as part of this project to an island um, called St Kilda, which is off the Outer Hebrides. It's um, six hours on a sailing boat, if you're lucky. Um, and for me, this was a horrific thing. I don't know anyone who has met Shona will know she can persuade anyone to do anything, but seriously, that is at the edge of anything that I'm ever prepared to do, and I still went. But what was interesting, was right from the moment that I knew I was going, my experience was different from Claire's. <coughs> I was genuinely, I actually think I have almost post-traumatic flashbacks for imagining going, if that sounds possible. I was so scared about going. As it turned out, we had really calm weather and it wasn't too bad. But I read everything, I was obsessed with what's it going to be like on this boat? Am I going to be sick? What's it going to be like on an island where there's no contact with the outside world whatsoever? Um, so my anticipation of that was really rich. Claire just, you know, we've got her to talk about it. She didn't imagine it in that same way. She didn't have that sense of where she was going or what it was going to be like. So some of the things I've learned from this time with Claire is, is first of all, something that I had taken for granted is how um, is how important our sort of culturally defined memories are in terms of who we are. So, uh, for, for, for give you an example of a conversation that was shown in myself and Claire having a discussion, and Shona said something about, oh, my son's just had his hair cut, and he's come home, and he, he looks like he's had a mullet. Now, there will probably be some people in this room that means nothing to, but there'll be a few people who are around in Britain in the 1980s who will know that a mullet was not something that you would want your child to come home with. It's one of these horrible haircuts, which is all long here and, and so on. But of course, Shona and I fell about laughing when, when Shona, did you both have mullets? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, now the thing is, we can all have a laugh about that, but what you forget is that a passing comment like that leaves Claire completely cold. It means nothing to her. And we'll have some sense of that if you've spent a lot of time with people who have a very different cultural background to you and you, you make a joke that relates to an old cartoon or an old advert or something and, and it doesn't resonate. But for clear nothing, none of that resonates. That sense of identity is partly tied up in our cultural past and our shared cultural history and our ability to talk about that. Another thing that I really found with, with Claire, which is um, kind of really relates to this time travel, is this this for her, daydreaming just doesn't happen. Daydreaming is actually, if she doesn't have something to do, like a game of papers or her lists, she enters this place that's really frightening for her. It's totally unknown. It's, it's like she's bombarded with thoughts that don't tie up, that don't mean anything. Um, we just, you know, we can really enjoy those moments of traveling in time. Claire can't do it, and therefore that, that empty space, that void for her is a really frightening place. Um, I've already mentioned that her sort of view of the future and her sort of projection forward is very, very different, much less rich. It's not like she can't 
describe what she thinks it's going to be like, but she's not inhabiting that future in the way that the rest of us do. And you've only got to experience a major life change, maybe something terrible like a bereavement or something good like a new job, to realise that when a surprising event happens to you, you have actually gone way ahead. You've walked into your, your future landscape far more than you probably had realised. And you spend a lot of time having to readjust that, that kind of future landscape that you had built. So we do it far, far more than I think we realise. Um, her narrative, her timeline is also very, very different. So she, one of the biggest struggles for her is that she was asked to produce a timeline, to, to get photos, to get information, to give herself a sense of what her narrative was so that she could refer back to that. Um, she found that really hard and actually one of the things that came out of this project is that um, Claire chose to represent her memories in a very different way. I don't know if you can see anything very much here, but this is the, the picture that's up in the Wellcome Trust. And she started to draw her memories attached to a tree. And she came up with her own key, which was solid attached memories, broken lost memories, memories that can be rejobbed, new memories I've made. And for her, it was actually much easier to present her memories in this way and not to think of them as having to be in a particular order. Um, and this has been really important finding for us because all the rehabilitation work is about getting people to, to form this kind of timeline and this narrative so that they know where they are. But actually for her, this was a much better way of her establishing her sense of place and her sense of self in relation to the rest of her life. Um, and the other big thing that she talks about is this adjustment she's had to go from I am this, not I was that. So I am now this person and to get away from that person that she thought she was. But the biggest difficulty for her is dealing with other people's sense of who she is now. So her sense of who she is and her sense of self and everything is very different from other people's sense of who she is, which is built essentially from their, their memories of her. And those memories for her don't exist. So this one of the hardest things for her is this clash between who, what people expect her to be and what she actually feels like she is. Um, and for most of us, those things tend to concur because we, we have shared memories and shared social space. Um, and I think this is really interesting in relation, um, again, to the, to the first talk, is that Claire has a huge number of well-rehearsed stories. It took me a while meeting up with her to realise this. She, she tells you things. Oh, when I was six, I was listening to Elvis and da 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 and she reels off this memory. And you, you get absolutely get the impression this is a recollective experience. But what you realise is that unlike what happens to the rest of us, where we adapt and change that memory, and mal it becomes malleable, it changes in, in, in relation to it. Her memories do not change, they're utterly fixed. So I can, 10 years later, she will tell me exactly the same memory. Nobody does that if, if, you know, without a memory impairment. People's memory adjusts, it changes, it's malleable. Hers is always exactly the same, almost word for word. And yet she uses these. They have a social function for her because she can do that thing of apparently reminiscing with people and telling them stories about herself. Um, but also it has a, a function in that it's something that she can reaffirm to give her a sense of who she is, what happened to her in her life. So telling those well with her stories become bits of knowledge rather than recollective experience, but they're still an important framework for her to know who she is. Um, and the, the, the final thing that I really found hugely important with Claire is the importance of ownership and agency. The, the most difficult thing for her is other people owning the memories of her life. They come and say, oh Claire, you won't know this, but you know, when you were 15, or when you were 25, or when your son was young, or after your son was born, she's got four children, doesn't remember anything anymore. Someone else comes in and tells her, this is what you did. Now, for most of us, our, our parents can get away with doing that. They can say, when you were three, you ran around without your nappy on, it's hilarious. And that's all right for your parents to say that. For Claire, she's continually being told this stuff about her, and she finds it really, really incredibly difficult that she does not have agency and ownership of her own memories. Other people own those memories for her. So I, I just finally just want to finish with some good news with Claire because one of the things we've been doing is working with this sense camera which is a little camera she wears around her neck and it takes photos automatically in response to 
changes in light and movement and stuff. And I won't go into the science of it now, but it seems to be an incredibly effective way of helping her to consolidate memories. So if she looks back over those pictures within a day or two, she can remember them six months, eight months later. Those memories seem to be consolidated. And this is, this is a whole long story attached to that, which I, I won't go into. But just to give you a feeling, this is Claire on the boat and writing the diary when we were going out to St Kilda. And here's just some of the sense cam pictures um, that, that came from her camera. So you get a feeling that they're not like snap pictures. They're quite different. They take an angle, they capture very unusual cues that you wouldn't necessarily think to take a picture of. And uh, she kind of uh, can go through those and it helps her to basically own that event to help reinforce it, help consolidate it. And even when that doesn't happen, she still feels like she can go back and say, well, this is what I did. And I, she can share it and talk to people about it. Um, and just to give you a little bit of brain imaging, very, very quickly, this was a control people doing a sort of um, thinking about the childhood task in relation to a control task. This is Claire trying to think about her childhood, very, very little brain activity going on there. And then what we did was we asked the control part, a group of control participants to have a flashbulb memory to think about something like Twin Towers or 9-11 or something. Um, yes, so think about very vivid event. Um, and this is the brain activity. And we used this to kind of compare with Claire. What we did with Claire was that we asked her, this was nine months after, we asked her to go back to a number of events, six events that we knew she'd reviewed on SenseCam and gone back over. And she's not looking at the pictures, this is her just trying to remember it. She had this absolute massive activation, completely uncontrolled in fact. So, and we've seen this in some of the other brain imaging that we've done with her. So when she does remember, it's almost this unconstrained activity that, that seems to um, be very different to what's happening um, when typical people remember. And I just want to finish with this quote from Martin Colmay because it really summarises so much of what we think memory is about in relation to us. So he says, memories are curious things. Sometimes they masquerade as thoughts, feelings or images without revealing themselves as memories. Sometimes they come to mind and seem relatively meaningless. Other times they overwhelm consciousness and cast us back into a vividly remembered past. They emerge into consciousness from somewhere else and give us cause for thought. Why? When a hysterical patient finally connects their intrusively persistent awareness of a disturbing smell to a memory of the smell of a particular person's cigar, why is it significant? It's significant because memories are an intrinsic part of us. They are the database or the content of the self. They ground it in a remembered reality that constrains what the self can be now and in the future and what it could possibly have been in the past. Because of this, memories are not some sort of mental wallpaper that merely provide a backdrop for the love of the self. They are alive, free, sometimes alien, occasionally dangerous mental representations that can overwhelm as easily as they fulfill. And I, I love that quote from Martin because it summarizes so much about the way that memory kind of makes us who we are. So apologies for the lack of dancing and natural tricks <laughs> <laughs> that that's fitted in with the first talk.